Hello friends, it's me, and today, Five Nights at Freddy's FNAF! Let's check out Game Theory, FNAF, A Fragmented Memory, Help Wanted 2, Film Game Theory, together, let's go! Internet, welcome to Game Theory. The sh Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory. Show that encourages you to be mask off. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to conclude the year of FNAF. With Tales from the Pizzaplex books releasing every two months, the Ruined DLC released back in July, and the FNAF movie happening in October, 2023 really did feel like the classic days of FNAF all over again, but there was a new release happening every few months. And to end the year of FNAF on an insanely high note, Steel Wool decided to pull one final trick out of the Scott Cawthon playbook. They released a second game within six months of Ruin. The completely unexpected, but very exciting sequel to FNAF VR Help Wanted. And let me tell you, they couldn't have released a more perfect game at a more perfect time. Because at a moment of peak frustration with the fanbase, when Foxy Stans and Bonnie Bros had all collectively thrown up their hands in desperation, this game swooped in to deliver the answers that they so desperately needed. If the narrative of FNAF is kind of like a cracked piece of pavement constantly on the verge of crumbling into dust, this game was the cement filling into crevices, <sighs> patching up all the holes in the narrative just enough to give the whole thing a solid foundation again, at least for another couple of months. And I really do mean that. Not since FNAF 6 has there been a Freddy's game so determined to tie up loose ends and deliver answers to the lingering questions that have been piling up in the background. Basically, Help Wanted 2 single-handedly put a close on one major story arc, while also opening the door to another, a next generation. It's an ending and a beginning, all in one, depicting a cycle of violence that shows that you're never truly out of the woods when you're in the world of FNAF. In short, it's probably the single most important game release in the last six years for this franchise. So today, we're gonna solve this game together to see what it's trying to tell us and where it's pointing the series moving forward. So grab your faz wrenches and get ready to step into madness, theorists. Today, finally, we're gonna see what lies behind the mask. As the game <laughs> opens, we're welcomed in as a new employee of the pizzeria. Fazbear Entertainment is offering a new on-the-job training position for a future pizza professional. And after that short intro, we're immediately thrust into a pizzeria hub world full of training minigames, all while Helpy cheers us forward from his little projector in the corner. But very quickly, one question starts to rear its ugly head. Who are we? Who are we playing as? Throughout the various mini-missions that we're presented with, one line that we hear repeated over and over again is, what makes you so special? Three separate characters all bring it up. Moon, Baby, even Mystic Hippo. What makes you so special? What makes you so special? What makes you so special? Considering everyone... What makes you so special? Huh. ...keeps asking us, we should probably have ourselves an answer ready for him, right? Well, we get a solid idea of who we might be thanks to plenty of explicit clues that are sprinkled throughout the game. First and foremost, we know that we're a FAZ technician. Midway through the game, you unlock a FAZ wrench that allows you to access a secret back area of the pizzeria. In that back room, there's a glowing tower that should look familiar to anyone who played through the Ruin DLC earlier this year. An inhibitor. Back in that game, these devices stopped you from being able to remove your AR-enabled Vanny mask. But that's silly, why would that matter here? It's not like we're wearing a mask. Or are we? Sure enough, deactivating the tower allows you to reach up and remove the AR mask that's been stuck to your face since you first booted up the game. Suddenly, you see that this entire time you've been inside of a derelict pizzeria, worn down, decayed. And this isn't just any ruined pizzeria, it's the FNAF 6 location, complete with a recharge station and a Freddy Spaghetti hole front and center. Not only is this just a fantastic mid-game twist that completely recontextualizes everything that you 
thought you knew about this game world, but it also helps confirm who we are and why we're down here. You see, us having a vanny mask? It's weird, right? Like, who are we? Why would we have something like this in our possession? Well, it has to do with our job. In Ruin, Helpy tells us that these AR masks were worn to help technicians navigate through the destroyed pizza plex. Now, when I first saw that in the game, I was convinced that it was a trick just to get us to wear the mask and teach us the mechanics of this new game. But here we are in Help Wanted 2 in a destroyed pizza plex wearing a vanny mask. And right there on the wall is a poster telling staff members to make sure they remove the mask at the end of the day. It proves that what Helpy was saying, at least in this moment, wasn't a trick. The mask is in fact a real tool that's used by Fazbear technicians, for as strange of a concept as that is. So, we're a technician for the restaurant, sure. But that's not the only thing we know. Our next clue comes in the form of the Faz Wrench. Midway through the game, you unlock this tool which allows you access to the back area of the pizzeria. Upon unlocking it, the Mystic Hippo Carney booth says that the key is familiar to us. Look at Mr. Gumble! He's familiar to you. So, we know that we're someone who's used this tool in the past. Immediately, that should bring to mind one person, Cassie's dad. Earlier this year in the Security Breach Ruin DLC, we were introduced to a young girl named Cassie, who goes on a mission to rescue her friend Gregory from the destroyed remains of the derelict Pizzaplex. Along the way, she too obtains a Faz wrench and says this. A Faz wrench? It's just like my dad's. It's a pretty explicit connection there, and that's not all. In the Fazer Blast arcade games and Help Wanted 2, we repeatedly hear the carny say this. Now, you look like you got him. Win a prize for the little one! So, we're a Faz tech who also happens to be a parent. Cassie's dad is literally the only character we know who truly fits the bill. But, so what? What's the big deal if we're playing as Cassie's dad? It's not all that interesting. And you heard what Moon said. What makes you so special? We're special in some way. And let, let, let me just make this perfectly clear. All dads are special, okay? They have very important <laughs> roles in their kids' lives. That's something that makes him very special, at least in my book. Uh, but obviously we're talking about FNAF. The joys of pr I agree with you, my pets. All dads are special. All father figures are special. All papa are special. Parental responsibility, not what these characters are referring to. In a theory that I posted a couple months ago, I proposed that Cassie's dad wasn't just any technician. Instead, he was none other than the Bonnie bro from FNAF 4. You know, the kid that wears the Bonnie mask who helps Michael torture his crying brother to death. We know from Ruin's item descriptions that Cassie's dad's favorite character was Bonnie. In that game, we were also able to collect both an old school Foxy and Bonnie mask, which was an odd detail when you consider that there were no other OG animatronic masks present like Freddy or Chica, that seemed to be referencing the masks that both Michael Afton and Bonnie bro were wearing on that fateful day in 1983. Those details, coupled with a few other things, led us to the whole Bonnie bro conclusion, but now that the full game's out, it certainly seems definitive that our theory was right. You see, towards the end of Help Wanted 2, we're given the chance to light fires next to the gravestones of some very familiar missing children. Children. Light them in a specific order, and you unlock a secret chest. A chest that contains none other than that old Bonnie mask. When you collect it, we see the text, this looks familiar. It also unlocks an achievement called Lost Luggage. This right here, this was our mask. It was one that we thought was lost to time. One worn during that horrific accident of 1983. Speaking of that date, in order to find the game's secret ending, we have to unlock six creepy voodoo doll plushies, each one hidden behind very explicit in-game actions. In one, you go to Sister Location's private room room and type in a very specific date. I bet you can guess what it is. 1983. And that year just keeps the bite of 83. It's coming up. Multiple mini games. The um, the bite of 83 take place during Fall Fest, which, in the previous VR Games DLC, was specifically called out as being in 1983. That is why we're considered special, because we were part of that fateful day, because by killing the crying child, we sent William on a murderous rampage. It's a memory that we, as Bonnie Bro, have tried to repress, and that's not just me speculating. We know that Bonnie Bro has been actively trying to avoid these memories based on Mystic Hippo asking us this. So, technically speaking, we are directly indirectly, uh, directly contributing to the FNAF franchise. Wow. Remember. It's also why when we collect one of the first secret voodoo plushies, we get a trophy in game whose description reads, Retrieve a memory. Basically, by playing this game and getting these secret objects, we're forcing ourselves to confront memories that we've buried deep in our psyche. We're coming to terms with the trauma of our past. We're accepting it as something that happened that cannot be changed, only atoned for. Which then brings us to the game's endings. If you play through the game normally just by completing the various minigames Helpy tasks you with, you eventually unlock the six members of the Faz Force. The FNAF 
Universe version of the Transformers, because let's face it, at this point, FNAF has literally parodied every IP known to mankind. No, I don't think so. Maybe it's Power Rangers. <laughs> Once you complete the collection, the lights flicker, and suddenly a charging station appears, which opens up to reveal the hand of our dear friend Glitchtrap. Another flash, suddenly the nightmare staff bots appear, attacking you. Glitchtrap has won. He's tricked us. He's used Cassie's dad's love of collectibles against him. Much like the tapes in Help Wanted 1, these action figures contained parts of him, his memories, his essence. By gathering them all together, we've once again made Glitchtrap whole. With Princess Quest being the canon ending and security breach, it means that Glitchtrap lost his hold over Vanessa. He needed himself a new helper, so he lured us in, the last human employee remaining, and got us to put the pieces back together to reawaken him. The cycle once again repeats. That's why we see him reaching out of the charging station, just like during the burn trap ending. He has enough strength to reawaken, to take control, and it's only then that the staff bots show up to kill us. But things aren't quite done yet. After our death, we change perspective into the eyes of a staff bot. And not just any staff bot, specifically, we're looking through the eyes of the the one who tells Cassie to take a mask at the beginning of Security Breach Ruin. Take a mask. Take a mask. It would seem like we've been absorbed into the system. Our consciousness is now part of this map bot. We're trapped in- So we died. Sadly we died side of it, forced to execute its commands. In the ultimate of ironies, the mask that we were using to try and stop Glitchtrap becomes the mask that we now give our daughter as map bots. This is then what results in her getting that occipital implant. This is how Helpy gets into her mind, and this is eventually how the mimic gets free. To me, the way that you get this ending, it's highly symbolic. By not accepting our past, by ignoring and repressing the scars of our past actions, by not unlocking all those memory plushies, we've passed our mistakes forward, and in the process, we managed to doom our our own daughter. Bonnie Bro didn't just ruin the life of one child, he wound up ruining two. Our actions have, in short, single-handedly prompted the events of ruin. But hold on, I, I just kind of glossed over a big detail there. We're attacked by a bunch of corrupted staff bots and then suddenly we're in map bot? How? It's kind of a big leap there, you know? Well, at first I thought that we were just scanned into the system. The mimic AI scanned our brains while we were wearing the vanny mask and boom, we're now stuck as part of the AI program running the whole pizza plex. But looking closer at the details, I think there's there's actually another explanation here. When you look at the map bot through the vanny mask in Ruin, it looks different from all the other staff bots that you encounter in the game. It looks more organic. You can actually see what appears to be a brain stuffed inside of its head. Compare that to how every other staff bot looks under that same AR lens, and it's completely different. Why would that be though? Well, it would appear as though our brain, or at the very least our organic matter, was stuffed inside of these robotic suits. It's part of what's powering this particular bot. But again I ask, why? This seems to be such a random detail. Until you remember what a computer brain would be learning from studying Afton's behavior. Afton stuffs his victims into animatronic suits. That's what he did during the missing children's incident. It's what we see Glitchtrap doing at the end of Help Wanted 1, and apparently it's what he did to Bonnie Bro. He stuffed him into Mapbot here. For a while there's been a lot of confusion about the true nature of Glitchtrap. Is it a virus? Is it Afton in the Mimic AI? Was Burn Trap the Mimic? It's largely been left unclear. But now I actually think this ending is trying to give us an answer. In the books, they make it explicitly clear that there are at least two mimics threatening the Pizzaplex. First, there's a physical mimic that's buried down in the basement that physically walks around and is able to kill people. Then there's the second version, a more general AI program that's eventually able to get installed to run the entirety of the Pizzaplex and is able to control and corrupt all the animatronics that work there. Is this- Oh, so it's like a physical mimic and a digital mimic. Mi mimic. Digital mimic. So it's like a virus la. What do you normally do with a computer virus? Uh, I, <laughs> I thought about Digimon. <laughs> Digimon! Evolution! confusing? Yeah. Is it frustrating? Most definitely. But I also now see what they were going for with the storyline. Remember how an AI works? You train it by feeding it situational data, and the data that goes in directly influences how it's going to behave moving forward. There's even an example of this with the Endo Daycare minigame in Help Wanted 2. You're teaching an AI program how to behave. Good data going in gives you good behavior. Bad data going in gives you chaotic behavior. In the books, we see the basement AI being trained up with a simple code. Rip off all the arms and legs of things that look 
humanoid. And it does this over and over again in epilogue after epilogue to each and every one of our teenage protagonists. The data that the basement AI was trained up on was simple and it was non-specific, but like a good program, it did exactly what it was told. Ripped off all those limbs. Now compare that to the Pizzaplex AI. This was trained using a lot more data. It was told to copy the behavior of actual humans, and so it learned coded languages. It learned a wider series of gestures and behaviors. It learned how to play games and hang up clothing. It was far more sophisticated. So by having two different versions of the mimic in the books, what- AKA, it was far more sophisticated, far more smarter, smart, far more cleverer. We're really seeing our different ways that an AI can be trained up and how the behavior spins off of that. So how's that all apply to the games? Well, in Ruin, there's a key moment on the catwalks of Monty Gator Golf that show two entities working together, but also acting separately as they're able to argue against each other. Helpy says, I took care of the situation, to which the mimic responds, yeah. They're cut from the same cloth. They both started as the Mimic program, but they've evolved in different ways. And based on all of that, I suspect that the Mimic Cassie runs from at the end of Ruin is a parallel for the book's basement AI, a simpler, older system that uses Gregory's voice to talk to us throughout Ruin. This one just exists and executes two simple goals, kill things and escape from the basement. But then there's the Pizzaplex AI. I suspect that this is the more sophisticated system. This is the one that's been trained up on Afton's data specifically. It's the one that embodies itself as Glitztrap, and it's also the one that speaks to us in the form of Helpy. And we know this to be true because of what we see throughout Help Wanted 2. In this one game, the AI is drawing from pretty much every past animatronic, including characters like Scrap Baby and Lefty, which are odd pulls considering they're characters that were never put on display for the public. These were characters that only existed for the fake pizzeria made to entrap Afton in FNAF 6. So the fact that the system here knows about them means that they had to have come from Afton's mind. It's also also why in the Helpy Hospital minigames, we see a kid's drawing of a burning pizza restaurant with Helpy running away. That's how Afton was able to escape and live on. His consciousness was contained within the Helpy AI, which was able to survive the FNAF 6 fire. And remind me again, who's the one that encourages us to play these minigames throughout Help Wanted 2? The minigames that lead to the collection of the Faz Force toys, which ultimately give us the bad ending? Oh yeah, it's Helpy. And not just any Helpy either. Helpy spelled with an I. That spelling detail actually matters. You see, the name of the physical animatronic Helpy, it's spelled H-E-L-P-Y, but in Ruin, that digital neural implant Helpy is spelled H-E-L-P-I, and once you know it, in the game files for Help Wanted 2, the Helpy on the projector screen is once again spelt with an I. This is Glitchtrap, the mimic program trained up on Afton's data. He's yet again trying to put the pieces back together, and by completing his tasks and unlocking the Faz Force, you help him to succeed. He's now back in full control of the Pizzaplex, ready for Ruin, ready to create a new servant in Cassie to finish what Vanessa started. But if I've learned- So it's like an evil version of Ultron. Evil... Artificial intelligence. Learned anything from Steel Wool, it's that you can't always trust the first ending you see. Remember that creepy plushie that we unlocked earlier? Well, there are six of them in total, each one unlocked via a seemingly random series of actions. Put a code into the whack-a-mole game backwards. Make a weird soda mixture only during a complete electrical shutdown of the factory. Shoot a random rocket ship during various Phaser Blast minigames and- Wait, 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 wait. If you really think about it, right? If there's evil artificial intelligence, there must be a counter to it. Just like how in Chinese we call it in yang, in yang. If there's an evil artificial intelligence, there must be a positive, a good guy, good guy, bad guy, you know? So where is the... Huh. Interesting. Where is the vision to Ultron? Until you get to FNAF 2, at which point you pop balloon recreations of the animatronics to unlock a final boss battle against a cutout of spring trap. Like I said, these get bizarre and they get convoluted in a hurry. But the main thing you need to know about them is that by collecting them, you unlock a glitched coin that allows you to play the fourth and final version of Princess Quest's arcade cabinet. At first, it plays just like your normal Princess Quest minigame. You swing your sword, you kill the glitchy bunnies, you collect the keys. Simple. At least until it's not. You open a door and you suddenly find yourself standing next to someone playing an arcade cabinet. Next thing you know, the princess is standing there in the room with you. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, this is 
nuts. The real world and the digital world are leaking into each other. Reach into the screen, grab your sword, and suddenly you are the princess. Who's the princess now? <laughs> Glowing sword in hand. Oh, mad bad. Don't curse, man. Family friendly. Awesome. Thank you. We fight our way through the glitching bunnies until we meet the old Red King. We give him our Vanny mask, and in return, he gives us the glitch trap plushie from Help Wanted 1. And this is where things go really off the rails. Out of nowhere, the sister location elevator appears. Hop in, and suddenly it takes us inside of a giant claw machine, with a giant Vanny staring in at us. We offer up the glitch trap plushie, revealing the true glitch trap. She crushes him, and then fades into darkness. Doing so unlocks a trophy named Consequences. The description reads, System threats found, repair complete. So, what was all that? Well, actually, like a firewall. Antivirus. Actually, it seems pretty explicit. Glitch Trap was the system threat. By crushing him, he's been deleted, and the wider AI system's been repaired. We won! Except, is that possible? Didn't I just say that the other ending showed us the start of Ruin? For that game to exist, which we know it does, Glitch Trap has to survive here. So is this secret ending not canon then? Just a cool reveal with no substance? No, actually, I don't believe so. For the first time ever in this franchise's history, I, Matt Pat, believe that both endings are canon. Let me explain. I do think that we're destroying Glitch Trap in the Vanny ending, but I'm not exactly sure it's a system-wide removal. Instead, I suspect that this ending is specifically about Vanessa herself. We've known since the original Help One that Vanessa, Glitch Trap, and Princess Quest have all been inextricably connected. For those of you who don't remember, the Princess Quest minigame originated back in the 2D version of Help Wanted, where they needed a game to replace the original mechanic of piecing together the missing 16 tapes from Tape Girl. Here, we watch as Vanessa, the princess, falls victim to Glitch Trap. In Security Breach, you beat Princess Quest 3, which shows Glitch Trap being defeated and Vanessa walking out of the Pizza Plex freed, leaving the Vanny mask behind. So the fact that we're now playing Princess Quest again tells me that we're not fighting to remove Glitch Trap from the Pizza Plex system, instead we're yet again fighting specifically to free Vanessa. These games have always been about Vanessa and Glitch Trap. I wouldn't expect 4 to deviate from that pattern. Even my old buddy Candy Cadet's trying to tell us that this game is about finishing Vanessa's story. Throughout Help Wanted 2, you collect coins that can then be traded to Candy Cadet for pieces of a story. His second one tells about a young woman that's been lured in by a friendly voice, only for it to have been a witch that tries to eat her. Now let me tell you a story about a young woman who, when she was little, was led into a dark forest by a witch and almost eaten. She manages to escape, but she's permanently scarred in the process. When she's older, she returns and is met by a young boy who offers to help. When she had grown, she sought revenge on the witch and entered the forest again willingly. She was greeted at the mouth of the forest by a young boy who offered to help guide her through the darkness. She welcomed the help and followed the young boy over the river, through the jagged trees, and toward a small house. She followed the boy into the house. The oven door closed. The witch would finally have her meal. This right here, this is Vanessa's story. Cut and dry. She was lured in by what she thought was a friendly voice, Tape Girl, telling her to gather the tapes to stop Glitch Trap, only for Glitch Trap to then take control. She does escape, but is permanently scarred by this. She has the Glitch Trap virus inside of her. It's not in full control, but it's definitely there, which is what we hear about in the emails from FNAF AR and the retro CDs from Security Breach. I compartmentalized him. He's locked away. She had compartmentalized him. He wasn't in full control, at least not yet. She then comes- But he still exists inside you. He's in prison, yes, but he still exists inside you. Oh. Comes back to try to kill Glitch Trap herself, but runs into a young boy, who seems like he's gonna help her, only to lure her deeper under Glitch Trap's control. By the time she transfers to the Pizza Plex, Vanessa's tone has changed in her therapy tapes. I'm needed somewhere else now. Thank you. We see the same thing in the FNAF AR emails. She's no longer in control. Glitch Trap has completely taken over, and it's all thanks to the only little boy that we know of, Gregory. Thanks to his retro CDs, we know that he was meeting a person in a bunny costume. You're talking to someone, or something. It's hard to tell. What are those things? They almost look like rabbit ears. Gregory is a villain. At the very least, he was at some point in the story. That is clear as day. Between this Candy Cadet story, GGY, and the fact that he was clearly working with Vanny before the events of Security Breach, he is not on our side. He was the one that helped Glitch Trap to take full control of Vanessa, right up until the end of Security Breach. Even cut lines of dialogue from Help Wanted 2 seem to support our conclusion here. These voice lines come directly from Vanessa, and they tell us the following, quote, You need to listen to me carefully. Don't help it escape. 
It's using you to finish where she left off. Only a small piece of his code remains. Vanessa is back to being more in control, but she knows that a small part of him remains. The glitch trap plushie that started it all back in Help Wanted. We also get lines like, the memories are freed, use the token, bring him to me. Referencing the memory plushies that we're collecting, the glitched princess quest token, and then being told to bring the plushie to her so that she can crush it herself once and for all. Destroying glitch trap inside of her mind allows that other persona, Vanny, to finally fade into darkness. Vanessa is truly free. And we know this to be true because after this ending, when you go back to the main hub screen, Puppy's gone. Replaced by a boy claiming that the Fazbear pizza tastes like real cheese. Delicious for him, but even tastier is the fact that Helpy's been purged. Glitch Trap is gone. At least, he's gone from this version of the program. And you see, this is what I meant about endings and beginnings. This, to me, feels like a very specific end. The end of Vanessa's story. And with it, the end of this current era of FNAF. From Help Wanted 1 to Help Wanted 2. Let's call it the Vanessa arc. She's no longer a part of this story. Her battle's over. We saved her completely. But in closing out her story, the cycle also repeats. Yet again, we have ourselves an innocent girl, this time named Cassie, being lured in by a seemingly friendly voice, Gregory. But in reality, it's all a trap. Thanks to that occipital implant, she now has Helpy as a part of her mind, just like Vanessa did with Glitch Trap. And now she's wearing the mask more and more frequently, again like Vanny. In short, it's been past- So it's a loop. A new loop. It's like, technically speaking, you killed the demon lord, the bad guy, but the demon lord will still come back. I always come back. No, no, no. It should be. <clears throat> I always come back. Passed on. Cassie is just Vanessa 2.0. Gone is the era of Vanessa and Glitch Trap. Long live Cassie and the Mimic AI. At this point, the only question is, what's it truly gonna take to break this cycle once and for all? But hey, well, I'm gonna continue digging for deeper lore and winning all these prizes. What do we got? No chip. Head chef bots. Great, just what I always wanted. I wanted to make sure you guys had a chance to win some prizes of your very own. In fact, there's actually a chance to win $10,000. That's all thanks to our sponsor for today's episode, SoFi. If you don't already know, SoFi is the all-in-one personal finance app that allows you to bank, borrow, and invest all in one place. And that couldn't be more useful as we wrap up the holiday season. Buying presents for family and friends? Yeah, it adds up fast. Especially when you consider that Amy's in charge of my Black Friday shopping. Which is why it's so important that I'm able to stay on top of it all. But SoFi SoFi doesn't just help by making everything easier to track, it also offers incredible rates on your savings. Most banks, they're only going to be offering savings accounts with about like 0.46% interest. Literally pennies. Your money would be better off stored in your mattress. Thankfully, SoFi offers up to a massive 4.6% APY with direct deposit. That is up to 10 times the national savings average. And the best part is, you don't even have to do anything. You just drop your money into the account and in just 5 weeks with direct deposit, you'll have earned more interest than you would have in an entire year with a traditional bank. Plus, if you're new to SoFi, they'll even help kickstart your savings by giving you up to 300 bucks when you sign up for direct deposit. So you don't even have to have savings when you start. But if you really want to give those initial savings a boost, then you'll want to get your hands on that juicy $10,000 that SoFi and I are giving away as a part of this deal. All you have to do is use the link in the description, SoFi.com slash Game Theory, or scan the QR code that's on screen right now, and sign up for a SoFi checkings and savings account. I always love it when brands do stuff like this. It gives us a chance to give back to the community, you guys. Not only does it make me feel like a mini Mr. Beast, but just knowing that this is gonna help one of you loyal theorists out there save for college, or buy a house, or kickstart your next dream project. Did Matt Pat just say Matt, mini Mr. Beast? That right there just brings a big old smile to my face. So remember, link is in the description, or you could always scan the QR code on screen right now for a chance to win that insane amount of money. Thanks again to SoFi for sponsoring this episode, and as always, remember, my friends, it's just a theory. A game theory! Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you find this video very interesting to watch. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in my next video. Thank you. Yes. And once again, five more seconds, I guess. So, anyways, thank you so much, my pet, for watching this video. And if you are here after watching 20 plus minutes of my channel, uh, ne nearly 30 minutes, subscribe. Thanks. Thank you. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. <coughs> and I hope to see you all in my next video. Thank you so much. Subscribe. Thank you. But seriously, thank you so much. Subscribe.